Chapter Eighteen of the Submarine Boys for the Flag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Chapter Eighteen. F. Bets an anchor against a fish hook the government possesses the fellow's charts and notes anyway observed jack benson rather proudly yes thanks to you gentlemen nodded the commandant still i fancy the authorities will be fearfully annoyed over this escape there are no particulars sir you say queried jack no the mere announcement of the fellow's escape and a request to military and naval authorities to be on the lookout for the fugitive the dispatch also states that description will follow by wire we can give you a pretty fair word portrait of millard right now sir offered lieutenant benson and i wish you would jack proceeded to do so he had about finished when the carriage stopped punctually before the door of the officers club the commandant took cordial leave of his young guests after which they were driven to the railway station just a little later they found themselves leaning back in parlor car seats bound for washington most of the way back the youngsters dozed in their chairs now that the excitement was over all felt need of rest not even at the railway station in washington could they escape the watchfulness of the navy department the same messenger who the day before had handed them their copies of the regulations now met benson with a note the secretary will not be at his office until one o'clock this afternoon announced lieutenant jack looking up from the order we are directed to report at that hour what shall we do until then demanded f blankly when the messenger had departed why since we're still in the service laughed jack and as i've heard that the arlington is much patronized by navy officers suppose we treat ourselves to a carriage go to the arlington and register that'll be the last grand feeling we'll get out of this his comrades rather merrily agreed so a few minutes later the trio marched through the lobby of the arlington to the desk jack picked up a pen and registered john benson u s n hal and f followed suit then they were led to their connecting rooms we'll have luncheon at half past eleven smiled lieutenant jack as he dropped into an easy chair in the service one never knows when his next meal is coming good chuckled hal though there was a sad ring to his tone keep up as long as you can old fellow the fiction that we're still in the naval service well aren't we demanded jack stoutly surely assented hal meekly say demanded f taking out notebook and pencil what is an ensign's pay anyway seventeen hundred dollars a year replied benson i don't suppose the navy department will try to spring less than a day's pay on us hinted f if that's right then the government now owes me three hundred and sixty-five into seventeen hundred let me see oh cut it laughed hal what my pay demanded f not much sir i want the only money i ever really earned oh one of us ought to drop mr farnum a line into jack presently oh well let hal do it offered f he carries the only fountain pen in the crowd without a word hastings crossed to a table on which were envelopes and paper and began to write perhaps he welcomed something to occupy his mind for truth to tell each of these submarine boys had a woefully blue feeling though all were naval officers still at this moment all realized that they would cease to be such as soon as they had received the thanks of the secretary of the navy however blue as all three felt none of them hung back when half-past eleven arrived they descended to the dining-room where they refreshed themselves heartily the meal over there was just about enough time left for them to walk comfortably to the navy department they had walked a couple of blocks of the way when hal suddenly felt the stamped letter in his pocket 
he drew it out and glanced hurriedly down the avenue i don't see a letter box ahead fellows but i saw one halfway down the block at the last corner we passed you two keep right on i'll join you presently jack and eph halted in their walk to look back where is hal demanded somers he can't have lost us muttered jack oh i guess he's simply taken a short cut to meet us ahead on the way yet they continued to look for their comrade until they had neared the state war and navy building hal hastings had not again appeared in sight say but this is fearfully careless of good old hal muttered jack benson uneasily as he glanced at his watch we've no time to go back to look for him either for we've barely time to reach the secretary's office we'll have to go in without hal then grumbled eph makes me feel like a fool too had the two lads but known it there was still plenty of time for the secretary of the navy may make an appointment with an understrapper and then find that he must first see some more important personage there were big callers ahead of the boys that day so that it was nearly two o'clock when lieutenant jack and ensign f were admitted to the presence that they were to leave shorn of their brief rank and command good afternoon lieutenant benson good afternoon mr somers was secretary saunders swift greeting you were most successful and i must congratulate you heartily but where is mr hastings we don't know mr secretary jack admitted he left us for a short time as we thought and since then mr saunders wheeled sharply as the door opened and a clerk came in pardon me sir apologized the clerk but a note has just come for lieutenant benson sir and the messenger was insistent that it was a most important matter you must take your note and read it lieutenant suggested the secretary of the navy young benson gave a start when he recognized in the address the handwriting of hal hastings in another instant jack gave a much more violent start for these were the words that met his astonished gaze dear jack i am in a washington police station feeling like a number one idiot soon after leaving you i ran into millard face to face there was a policeman within two hundred feet at the moment i let out a full siren yell and dashed at millard he held on to me until the policeman reached the spot i let him hold me thinking that was the easiest way but millard produced a paper a request from the military authorities at fort craven to arrest and hold any one pointed out by the bearer i talked some to that policeman but it did no good he took me to the station house and here i am millard vanished after saying that he'd wire the news of my arrest to fort craven you'll have to explain me out of this yours disgustedly hal may i read this to you mr secretary begged jack benson do so lieutenant i'll be back in a moment muttered the secretary of the navy rising and hastily quitting the room the instant that high official was gone eph caught at his sides with his hands oh wow woof mm pa chuckled young somers his face distorted with glee someone catch me i'm choking great scott what wouldn't i have given to see that hal the quiet the dignified oh dear oh dear hal pounces on the fellow to arrest him and hal is the one who gets pinched woo woo i can see hal's face right now i'll wager an anchor to a fish hook that the astonished look is stamped on hal's face so hard it won't come off for a week Ooh, woof f was laughing so hard that the tears streamed down his face quit that commanded jack stepping over to his comrade his own face stern it's no laughing matter why won't they hang hal sputtered f as soon as he could talk hal will be at liberty almost at once but fancy the shock imagine the dear old fellow's astonishment and the jolt to his feelings again f somers went off into a paroxysm of laughter it seemed uncontrollable for f had a strong sense of the ludicrous and hal's face as somers pictured it 
must have been a tremendously funny sight at the instant when millard so neatly turned the tables come quit your nonsense grumbled jack disgustedly i can't roared eph going off into still another burst of laughter just at that instant somers gave himself the lie the door opened admitting the secretary of the navy in a fraction of a second ensign eph had straightened up while his face was solemn enough for an indian chief's countenance i've just been straightening out that little matter explained mr sanders i've talked with the police and have described hastings the police are in deep chagrin over their blunder mr hastings is now at liberty and on his way here at a motion from mr sanders the two young officers seated themselves the secretary turned to his desk to sign some papers from f suddenly came a suppressed explosive sound jack seated beside him on a sofa gave somers an indignant elbow jab the secretary glanced up then resumed his writing a minute later there came from f the sound of another smothered explosion the picture of hal hastings indignant astonishment had once more been conjured up before young somers face poor f was red in the face with all the effort of keeping back his laughter i fear you must have caught some cold standing watch on the gunboat's bridge said the secretary sympathetically that sobered somers in an instant the notion that he he a sea dog accustomed to stand watch in all weathers could catch cold through exposure of the kind just mentioned made f feel a sense of ghastly humiliation five minutes later ensign hal hastings was shown into the office the secretary of the navy greeted him kindly though with a twinkle in his eyes the paper that caused my trouble was one that was taken from mr benson when he couldn't help himself hal explained for some reason the military authorities never discovered that millard had that paper about him it was enough to save him from arrest an hour ago and millard is still at large nodded mr sanders it's a matter for the military authorities and the secret service i imagine i don't see how the navy can be drawn into it however i am going to ask you young gentlemen to retain your special appointments a little longer i may yet have considerable need of you in this affair you are stopping at the arlington perhaps for this afternoon you would enjoy going over to the united service club where you are likely to meet a good many army and navy officers i'll send someone along with you who will see to it that you have ten day cards at the club at any other time this all would have meant to jack benson that he was still an officer in the navy just now however it meant that millard was at large and benson had a strong notion that it would yet fall to the lot of the submarine boys to put that wretch where he belonged end of chapter eighteen recording by john brandon chapter nineteen of the submarine boys for the flag this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Chapter 19 Jack's Caller at the United Service Club. Ho oh, ho! Ha ha! Woof! F found himself started again the very instant the boys found themselves in the lower corridor of the building let him alone uttered jack scornfully the poor fellow had better work it all out of his system but hal your face when the policeman took you on millard's complaint sputtered somers next going off into another burst of laughter it didn't seem funny at the time returned hal hastings quietly ho 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 ha of course not say hal can you do me a tremendous favor can you look just for a moment the way you did when that blue coat pinched you hal began to laugh despite the fact that his loss of millard still rankled under his quiet outside now hush up warned benson suddenly here comes lieutenant ulwin 
who has undertaken to present us to the united service club idiots are barred from the club you know f by a great exercise of willpower f managed to straighten his face by the time that the lieutenant overtook them they entered a cab by this time the young naval officers were beginning to understand that it is the usual custom to go about washington in a carriage have you ever been at a service club before inquired their guide we breakfasted at the club at norfolk this morning jack answered your acquaintance with our service clubs is not very large then we've also been at the club at fort craven oh smiled lieutenant ulwin i guess you gentlemen have been about a little more in the two branches of the service than i had suspected you've seen the officers of both the army and the navy at play mostly at play i should say laughed benson the club is the only place where we can go and get away from shop talk continued ulwin as a rule the army and navy men at our club do not talk much shop it may be different today however why today asked jack because well you see i'm introducing three rather famous strangers today meaning began hal quietly you young gentlemen of course the whole nation has heard much about the submarine boys yet it is in the army and the navy after all that the deepest most abiding interest in you exists this red spot on my cheek isn't a blush explained ensign eph suddenly it's where a mosquito bit me i'm not joking replied ulwin with a friendly smile all the officers of the navy know about you by this time they'll be greatly disappointed when they see us then won't they laughed hal hastings now see here protested eph earnestly i can stand a good deal but if they see us walking around the club and ask who left the lid off the can of shrimps i'll fight ulwin laughed heartily i shall have to pass the word to our worst jokers he smiled that it won't be safe for the fellow who starts in to tease you young men why if anyone does start we've got to keep our tongues behind our teeth returned hal we're only boys kids and we can't say anything smart to men who've been a good many years in the service you can answer back if anyone starts to have fun with you replied lieutenant ulwin remember a club is where all men stand on an equal footing if an admiral gets after you you will do well to swallow any witticism he may try on you but with any officer below an admiral you don't have to be so careful f summers immediately began to look thoughtful now f did know how to say caustic things when occasion seemed to demand here we are announced lieutenant holwin suddenly as the cab stopped before the club building hal went in at ulwin's side jack gripped f by the elbow pulling the auburn-haired one back a few paces now see here f remember that we don't want any funny answers inside but ulwin says you listen to what i'm saying f i've known you longer than mr ulwin has just remember that we're boys b o y s boys not one of us is quite eighteen yet if we've gained a little fame for five minutes we mustn't begin to imagine that we're eight feet high and on a par with men forty years old so be careful if if anyone starts to have fun with you come back at him in a different way how whispered f look stupid what look stupid i don't see much in that why it's the funniest answer possible and besides it isn't fresh or forward how do you make that out f inquired why f boy if you're half as famous as you may think you are then folks will know you can't be stupid so if you pretend to be you'll have everyone guessing what you mean by looking that way on the other hand if you look stupid and no one is surprised then you'll discover that that's just the way the crowd had you sized up in advance i see nodded f but it was plain that jack's almost direct command was not wholly pleasing to summers the two comrades now caught up with Owen and hal at the elevator we'll go up to the reading room first 
proposed Lieutenant Ulwin. That's where the afternoon crowd is usually found. Anyone who had been looking for color or pomp would have been disappointed. The only uniforms in sight were those worn by two bellboys. The officers of the Army and Navy present were all in civilian dress. They looked like a lot of cheerful, prosperous businessmen. Hello, Ulwin. What are you doing with my friends from Dunhaven? eagerly called one young man, rising hastily and coming forward. Benson, I'm glad to see you. And you, Hastings, and you, Summers. Didn't know you knew the young gentleman, McCrae, broke in Ulwin. Don't know them. When they made me the laughing stock of every mess room crowd in the Navy for months, retorted McCrae. Jack, Hal, and F. were shaking hands with the speaker with a good deal of pleasure. It was Lieutenant McCrae, one time watch officer on the battleship Luzon. At one time, McCrae had doubted that submarine boats were, in all respects, as wonderful craft as were claimed. The submarine boys had paid him back in most laughable fashion. Lieutenant McCrae, at one time had felt himself more aggrieved over the wholesome teasing of his brother officers in consequence, but he had long since learned to accept the whole incident as a good and deserved joke. Now McCrae stood wringing the hands of the boys as though he had found long-lost friends. What are you doing these days, McCrae wanted to know. Anything besides testing new boats at Dunhaven? You must greet them as comrades, McCraig, continued Lieutenant Ulwin. What? Cadets at Annapolis? In this case, McCraig wondered at their being there, for cadets would be considered forward who visited an officer's club. Benson is a lieutenant, his friend's ensigns, replied Ulwin. Come, come, laughed McCrae. I'm easy. These boys know that. But don't tell me. Fact, though, replied Elwin. They hold special appointments for some special duty or other. I'm here at the direction of the Navy Department to introduce these young brother officers of ours and to procure ten day cards for them. By this time the news had spread. A score of officers, young or middle-aged, were crowding about. Ulwin had his hands full introducing the submarine boys. Yet they stood the ordeal well. The habit of command based on discipline had given these boys plenty of poise and self-possession. Nor were any attempts made at that time to have any good-humored fun with them. Half a dozen officers representing foreign navies were present, these two came in for introductions. The foreigners were mainly military or naval officers attached to foreign embassies at Washington. By Jove, Benson, I've had it in mind for some time that I wanted to meet you and grasp your hand, murmured Lieutenant Abercrombie of the British Navy, as he drew Lieutenant Jack to one side. By Jove, old fellow, I want to meet you soon. I want to meet you soon and have a good old talk all by ourselves. This will be most agreeable to me, nodded Jack pleasantly. And your comrades, too, added Abercrombie. You know, you're already known on the other side. Fact, I assure you. Only the other day, I picked up a London magazine and read quite an account of the doings of you three. I was especially interested in an account of how you three discovered a way of leaving a submarine at the bottom and swimming to the surface, then diving and re-entering the craft while she's still on the bottom. But your method is a secret, I suppose. Yes, smiled Jack. At least the American Navy alone shares the secret with us. Oh, uh, I'm not asking it, you know, old fellow, Lieutenant Abercrombie assured him. Is Mr. Benson here? called a bellboy from the doorway. Very much so, replied Lieutenant Holwyn dryly. May I give you a message, sir? asked the bellboy, coming closer. 
after excusing himself benson stepped aside with the boy yet the latter spoke loudly enough for several to overhear there's a lady downstairs at the door would like to see you sir she says it is very very important sir did she give any name inquired astonished jack she begged that you would overlook that sir and just step down to the door for a few moments all right i'll go nodded benson but it looks queer excusing himself to his host ulwin and to some of the officers with whom he had been chatting the leader of the submarine boys went quickly to the coat room for his hat then descended in the elevator very strange place this for a lady to follow a gentleman to his club drawled a french captain one or two of the others laughed imagining that this was some flirtation in which the submarine boy had been engaged but f flared up a bit looking very red as he muttered it's only fair to tell you gentlemen that we submarine boys don't appreciate jokes at the expense of the finest fellow who ever lived mr jack benson good boy murmured teal yet when an hour had slipped by and benson had not returned even his loyal comrades began to wonder a good deal from that frame of mind they passed on at the end of another hour to worry End of chapter 19 recording by john brandon chapter 20 of the submarine boys for the flag this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kenneth sergeant gagan the submarine boys for the flag by victor g durham chapter twenty the girl in the cab as jack reached the door of the united service club he found no one at the doorway that's strange he muttered but in another moment he looked down the street a hundred feet away stood a closed cab from it a woman leaned beckoning slightly had she been veiled jack would have been instantly suspicious but her face showed and it was young fresh pretty and wholesome looking face i don't know her but she's evidently a lady thought jack benson quickly accordingly he stepped along the sidewalk lifting his hat courteously as he neared the vehicle you are mr benson inquired the young woman yes ma'am i trusted you will pardon my calling here and sending you a message but it was very urgent that i see you at once how urgent you cannot yet understand well i'm here madam jack replied not knowing what else to say i'm going to make another strange request of you it is granted in advance if possible will you step inside with me and drive a little way inquired the young woman jack glanced quickly at her her face was flushed evidently she was embarrassed won't you tell me a little more madam about your reason for wishing to see me he suggested yes but not here please she begged i don't want to be seen about here i shall not detain you long mr benson all i ask is that you sit here beside me and that we drive a little way while i say a few words to you jack hesitated but did not like the look of adventure yet on the other hand it was hard to see harm or danger in it the young woman was evidently as he had guessed a lady then you do not feel able to tell me here what you wish to speak with me about he inquired i shall begin as soon as we start our drive she promised oh please don't refuse me you can't imagine how much is at stake for me though jack benson felt the peculiarity of the request from a stranger he was unable to see how harm could result from his being kind very good then he agreed i will do my best by listening to you after he entered the cab and had taken a seat beside her the young woman turned to look at him keenly jack for his part saw that she was rather better dressed than the average he imagined her to be the daughter of a family in comfortable circumstances you do not know who i am of course she began no madam but you do know one in whom i have much interest she continued for some reason that he could not explain to himself jack benson began to feel very uncomfortable under the witching battery of her handsome eyes 
who is he inquired the submarine boy you know him as she paused as though stricken with sudden reluctance well said jack the name by which you know him is millard has jack benson been lashed at that instant with a whip he could not have been more astounded who he cried what he checked himself abruptly it was kind of you to stop as you did the young woman declared gratefully the man you know as millard is my promised husband i mean i'm astonished sputtered jack benson then he turned to take another keen look into her face what do you want to say to me about millard he demanded i ask you i beg you to aid him to escape from washington from the country yet to do all he needs to, is to get safely out of the district of columbia you know that he is here in washington or i would not have told you as much does millard find it so difficult to get out of washington queried jack grimly if he did not mr benson believe me i would not have come to the enemy to beseech mercy probably i am not telling you anything you do not already know she went on rather bitterly but every avenue of escape from washington is blocked by the secret service men it's not so difficult to hide in the city but to get out of it is impossible madam jack answered softly it would be my desire to give you every bit of aid and comfort possible however what you ask is simply impossible for one thing it would be in direct defiance of my oath he was about to add but checked himself on account of knowing that he would be sought at the united service club it was possible even likely that the enemy knew of his actual connection with the navy yet benson did not propose to supply the other side with any gratis information so he added contrary to my duty as an american i am loyal to the flag madam the boy continued do you know the nature of millard's offense no that is not exactly do you wish me to tell you why he he told me it was some dispute over international affairs stammered the young woman do you feel yourself a loyal american asked jack looking at her curiously yes she answered without an instant's hesitation looking straight into his eyes almost defiantly and you love this man millard yes yet her declaration was not so emphatic as it would have been a few moments before jack sighed would you love a man who betrayed his country's flag he asked presently in a very low voice has don has the man you know as millard offered to do that it was not suspicion but incredulity that rang in her voice jack benson knew now that he was dealing with a woman who knew herself to be a patriot a lover of her country i don't know that i have any right to say anything jack answered evasively mr millard is a civil engineer isn't he yes and a mechanical engineer too the girl admitted without attempted at concealment but as you also doubtless know he served once with a revolutionary army in guatemala it is some sort of scrape like this that he finds himself now some trouble that he has gotten himself into with this government in order to befriend the revolutionists of some central american republic did millard tell you so demanded jack his eyes now very wide open he let me believe as much girl replied one hand toying with a fold of her dress while she glanced down and that is the truth is it not no broke half angrily from young benson the passion would have rung in his denial but he remembered that he was talking to this girl about her betrothed husband he spoke of the flag a moment ago cried the girl suddenly and gazing searchingly into the boy's eyes did you mean to tell me that don uh, that mr millard would be engaged in any work hostile to his own country is this the one we called millard an american citizen asked benson yes then said jack jack came to an abrupt stop after that one word he would not tell the dreadful news to this spirited young woman it was not necessary but she became insistent mr benson she cried this has gone too far not to have a full explanation as has mr miller done aught to betray the united states for that matter how could he madam benson replied gravely no central american republic would want charge of our fortified harbors or notes concerning the fortification the harbor mines and so on for the very simple reason that no central american republic would ever be equal to the task of attempting to invade the united states 
did mr millard steal such plans make such notes she hissed the question sharply her face now deathly white that is a charge against him jack nodded did he do it i caught him at it over opposite fort craven young benson answered a low smooth cry escaped the girl her head rested against the side of the carriage as though her brain were reeling but at length she spoke you you would not deceive me she faltered you will tell me more i can't answered jack with a shake of the head further than that i cannot go oh i see she nodded i don't blame you you would feel that whatever you told me i would tell him but i wouldn't though the girl's face was still fearfully pallid her eyes as she turned to gaze into the submarine boy's face flashed with a new fire then after a brief pause whatever he is or has done i am an american she added quietly this has been a miserable fifteen minutes for me responded jack benson i have been torn between the impulse into my mind my own business and the fear that you may be throwing yourself away on a man whom you would properly learn to despise i shall never give donald graves another thought as a lover the girl rejoined promptly nor shall i shelter him i am going to him now then you have an appointment with him you know where to find him yes replied the girl looking at the submarine boy rather queerly you care to go with me to meet donald graves the one you know is millard but i'm stupid that would be to run you into needless danger for such a man i know donald graves to be would be desperate i'm not afraid of him retorted jack quietly if you fear only for me i beg you to take me to him end of chapter twenty recording by kenneth sergeant gagan Chapter Twenty One of the Submarine Boys for the Flag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sargent Kagan. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Chapter Twenty One. Daisy Houston decides for the flag it is a somewhat lonely place on the outskirts of the city warned the girl mr graves had thought that if no other chance offered he might possibly get away by leaving that house and taking to the country roads for he knows that if he takes a train at any point he won't ride five miles before he'll find himself in the clutches of a secret service man oh he knows how well the trains and the steamboats will be watched he dreads even that the country roads will be watched I don't know anything about the Secret Service lines that are out, Jack confessed honestly, and I imagine that every possible precaution has been taken to capture Millard or Graves. You don't know my name, cried the girl, as though struck by a sudden thought. Mr. Benson, you have been wrapped in so much mystery, so much deceit, so much lying and treachery, that I won't even have you guess whether I am telling you the truth. Here's my card case. Take out a card for yourself. The request was so much like a command that Benson obeyed. On the card, in old English script, he read, Miss Daisy Houston. I thank you, Miss Houston, he acknowledged gravely, handing back her card case. Will you signal the driver to stop? she requested. They were now driving through the western part of Washington. When the driver found himself signaled, he reined up, then came to the cab door. You know where to go, she said. Yes, nodded the man drive there then the driver whipped up his horses to a better speed while the vehicle bowling along now i feel very much fear that i'm running you into danger declared daisy houston soberly mr benson if you decide to leave the cab or to have me take you back to the center of the city i shall not imagine you to be lacking in courage i cannot be in any greater danger than you miss houston benson ventured with a smile oh it's much different in my case argued the girl Donald Graves would not attack a woman, especially the woman he had professed to love. Miss Houston, do you feel like discussing this matter any further? hazarded the young acting naval lieutenant. Yes, as much as you wish. I confess to be a, a bit curious. About what? Did Millard, or Graves, I mean, have any great reason to need money? More, I mean, than he could earn by honest work? Yes, admitted Miss Daisy. My mother is dead. 
under her will i will inherit a considerable little fortune when i'm twenty-five but it's solely on the condition that i have my father's permission to marry the man of my choice i could remain single until twenty-five but i'm only nineteen and mr graves complained that it would be an eternity to wait then your father did not approve of millard i am going to call him that because the other name is unfamiliar my father feared that donald was a fortune hunter he said he would be satisfied if donald could show that he was rich in his own name so graves or millard hit upon the plan of stealing our harbor fortification secrets and selling them to another government said jack meditatingly yet i'm puzzled to understand how he found the chance there are no foreign agents openly engaged in buying our national secrets i think i can explain all that though it will be guesswork replied daisy houston thoughtfully my father was for some years minister to sweden he is still well acquainted with foreign diplomats here in washington some of them are often at our house donald must have met one there who tempted him or pointed the way to a fortune yes i'm certain that must be the answer but perhaps you don't like me asking questions no no i don't mind now replied daisy houston i began to feel as though i had been an innocent party to donald graves wrongdoing when he went to try to see you this afternoon i suppose only that donald had gotten into trouble through some filibustering expedition to central america i did not look upon that as so serious you see but selling the national secrets is quite another matter she added bitterly i shall never care for that man again i have wrenched him from my heart in these last few minutes so you may ask me any questions that will help to clear up the matter thank you miss houston and did graves or millard as i call him expressed any hope of becoming suddenly well-to-do yes and now i can understand how he has lied to me he let me believe that he hoped to profit through mining concessions to americans that would follow the overthrow of one of those petty despots in central america yet millard has been away from washington much has he not most of the time during the last four months he generally managed to get over here one day out of seven sometimes two days at a time i believe the whole matter is becoming rather clear in my mind i do not mind telling you miss houston how i first came to know the fellow he was over at our shipyard in dunhaven trying to get employment on the construction of submarine boats but something in his manner made us suspect him and he, and he didn't get near the secrets of any of our boats there is one thing however that benson felt he would like to have cleared up so he inquired though he did not allow the girl to see the motion jack felt stealthily at his right hip pocket yes the loaded revolver was there jack did not believe in the practice of carrying concealed weapons he had great contempt for both the nerve and the judgment of fool boys who carried revolvers loaded or otherwise but just now the situation was different jack benson was an acting lieutenant in the united states navy just before leaving the navy department he and his comrades had each been advised to take a pro-offered weapon and carry it against the chance that they might find millard or graves in washington and find themselves under the necessity of taking him prisoner spies and traitors are taken alive or dead the official had remarked who handed them the weapons how much further have we to go inquired jack as the cab turned down a country lane oh a very short distance now replied daisy houston jove but she's a stunning girl for nerve and principle thought lieutenant jack admiringly she's going now to what must be the tragedy of her plans and hopes yet she has her color back again and looks as composed as though she was out for only an airing there's a house almost whispered the girl at last resting a steady cool hand on his arm jack looked and saw the place a little old-fashioned home standing among trees some hundred feet from the road in that swift glance he also noted there was no building on either side daisy houston did not ask whether the young man at her side proposed to try to arrest the man he sought she was too discreet to pry into his plans up into the little yard before the house the horses trotted then just as the cab was coming to a stop the driver cracked his whip lash twice immediately the door flew open millard as jack benson knew him stepped out jauntily a smile of delight on his face 
good enough daisy he cried as he strode toward the cab i see that you have one benson over to our side you shall be my friend after this but daisy what for the girl had sprung lightly out of the cab before jack benson could assist her the girl now stood drawn to a full height yet without affecting any theatrical pose but her lips hovered a smile of cool disdain that the look in her eyes heightened don't lie to me any more donald graves commanded the girl steadily and don't deceive yourself both tasks i know will be hard for a man so vile that he'd sell his country's flag millard stared at her in growing horror then anger rushed to his face daisy he gasped have you betrayed me have you brought benson here as an enemy daisy did not answer her former lover she continued to gaze at him with an irony of expression that sent the hot blood mounting to his head can't you speak he demanded then benson why don't you talk because replied jack i am waiting for miss houston to say to you all or as little as she cares to say speak then commanded millard turning to the girl my command to you retorted the girl is different silence never address me again you traitor to your flag millard was swift to realize the fullness of the girl's contempt he knew that everything between them was over come on come on then girl he uttered harshly it is time for you to be gone step into the cab and get away from here for i would spare you what is to follow my reckoning with benson he clapped his hands the door opened and four men stepped out their type was not hard to determine they were the scum of humanity ready for any desperate deed end of chapter twenty one recording by kenneth sergeant gagan chapter twenty two of the submarine boys for the flag this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by kenneth sergeant gagan the submarine boys for the flag by victor g durham chapter twenty two the part of abercrombie r n come girl you must go commanded millard harshly i will not she replied coldly until my escort is ready to go with me he will not go with you replied miller significantly and he must not remain what is to be done here is no thing for a dainty woman to see mr benson appealed the girl will you enter the cab first if he does the cab will not leave sneered millard all this while the four men who had just come from the house were stealthily grouping themselves jack watched them alertly he did not intend to be taken unaware yet he hesitated to draw his pistol while miss houston was there go girl millard ordered again i've told you already that i should only go when mr benson gives the word and accompanies me replied the girl white but courageous then we won't waste time laughed the wretched harshly since you will stay then you must be witness of what you have brought on my worst foe come on men close in get em as the men sprang to obey and jack dodged nimbly back daisy houston uttered a piercing scream the next thing she did was wholly natural under the intense strain of her feelings the girl fainted take her nodded miller to the driver who was plainly one of the desperate lot take her from here as fast as you can the driver ready for his work snatched up the girl's light form have a care what you do with you all of you cried jack benson warningly and now in his hand the revolver gleamed but one of the wretches darting in at jack's right from behind aimed a blow with a cudgel at the weapon he struck it from the young lieutenant's hand down to the ground it fell but lieutenant benson was as quick as thought now he bent over snatching up the weapon and then ducked away from a follow-up blow at his head and sprang back you first millard cried the young acting naval officer full of purpose lieutenant jack pressed the trigger it stuck no report followed that blow from the cudgel had jammed the cylinder having dropped the senseless form of daisy houston in the cab the driver sprang to the box lashing the horses just as lieutenant benson discovered 
the uselessness of his weapon as a firearm. Then, indeed, young Benson knew that this must be a fight to the very death. Yet he was a naval officer at heart, as much as by special appointment. At a time like this, he held life cheaply. The first man to get within reach was laid flat by a blow with the bunt of Jack's revolver. Instantly, young Jack Benson wheeled into a strike at another pressing foe. Instead, he received a glance through a painful blow on his own left shoulder. The assailant could recover, however. Benson leaped at him and would have felled him had not Millard himself leaped in, striking up the young naval officer's arm. Once more, Lieutenant Jack leaped back. His whole body was alert, nerves and muscles responding magnificently. He fairly vibrated defense. Close in on him and surround him, snarled Millard. You've got to get him. We haven't many minutes left. We didn't know at what instant to look for interference. Jack landed effectively on one of the other rascals. Just as he was wheeling, however, to ward off the attack of yet another, a stick landed against his knee, partly crippling him. And moving backward, Benson almost stumbled over a stone half the size of his head. Right there, in that same moment with which he thrust the revolver into one of his pockets, he bent down, snatched up the heavy stone, and held it poised over his head. Now come on, now close in, cried Jack exultantly. The first man who gets too close has his head split open. Who wants it? His usually good-natured face was transformed by the fiery rage of battle. Surely there was some of the old Norseman streak left in Jack Benson's makeup. As he stood there, keenly alert, ready to heave the rock, he looked like a young Thor armed with a massive stone hammer. Spread, get back of him, yelled Miller hoarsely. I'll take the position of attack in the front. Down him. Guess which way I'm going to heave this stone, cried Jack tauntingly, as he half wheeled so as to watch those trying to steal a march on his rear. Bosh, you can soon stop that, men, jeered Millard suddenly. Fall back, get a fistful of stones, rain them on the youngster at a safe distance. One of you will soon hit him and send him down. Young Benson gasped inwardly with dismay, though his face did not blanch. Millard's followers drew back to obey. Yes, these fellows could throw small stones from a much greater distance than the young lieutenant could hurl the large one. They had but to keep up this fire for a few seconds, when one of them was certain to hit him in the head, putting him out of the fight. Jack Benson dropped the big stone, though he stood over it. Like a flash, his revolver came out again. Aiming at Miller, the young naval officer made frantic efforts to make the cylinder revolve, but the weapon proved to be hopelessly jammed. Now, keep on volleying the youngster with until you have him down and wholly out, yelled Miller hoarsely. The air seemed filled with stones. Jack hopped as nimbly as possible, dodging all he could, yet one part of his body after another was hit. Rat a tat tat, Jack could hardly comprehend what this new noise meant when it grew in volume. Then a horseman rode into the yard at a charge. One down, yelled the horseman with a savage glee as he drove his mount squarely against one of the wretches, bowling him over and underfoot. Hardly seeming to veer, the rider made for another fellow, and barely missed him. Just a second later, so it seemed, this valiant rider hauled the horse on its haunches and swung back heading for another wretch. Miller leaped at the horseman, a stone in his uplifted fist. But Jack Benson saw him, and well-planted blow sent Miller to the ground. Bully, good of you, Benson, old chap, called a hearty voice. Then the horseman spurred forward, running down another of Benson's late assailants. The two remained bolted as fast as they could go. Mr. Abercrombie, cried Lieutenant Jack. Yes, it's I, and jolly good here I am in time, laughed the British naval officer with whom this brief rollicking battle had made as a gleeful as a boy. But how on earth did you happen to turn up? asked Jack, a feeling of mystery coming over him after he had glanced at Millard, and had made sure the latter would sleep for some time. 
Why, I was out for my afternoon canter, dear fellow, bubbled Lieutenant Abercrombie, R.N. I was coming down the road at a hard trot, don't you know, when a cab rolled by. A young woman, a deuce pretty one, thrust her head out and shrieked at me. What could I do? It was a deuce extraordinary. And I had to do something quickly, so I rode alongside the cab and told the driver to hold up. Oh, I must have looked unusually menacing, don't you know, for by Jove the fellow obeyed me. Then I reached up and yanked him down off the cab. The fellow really started to blackguard me, while the young woman was shouting something at me at the same time. I had to silence the fellow, don't you know, so I could understand the young lady. So I struck him over the head with the butt of my riding whip. My word, I must have hit the blackguard hard. For he just curled up and lay down. The young lady sprang out of the cab and begged me to hurry down here. She looked able to take care of herself, so I just left my revolver with her. By Jove, here I am, and deuce glad of it. Upon my word, Benson, dear old fellow, all the luck seemed to be running against you. It was, Jack admitted dryly. But now I've got the man I came after, and I've got to keep him, too, added Lieutenant Benson gravely. As he spoke, the submarine boy drew a pair of handcuffs from an inner pocket. By Jove, do you young naval officers in this country carry such jewelry? murmured Lieutenant Abercrombie, R.N. They do, I guess, when they're engaged on work like mine at the present, smiled Lieutenant Jack of the United States Navy. Now then, by Jove, I think we'd better go back to the young lady. Suddenly, decided Abercrombie, for Millard still showed no signs of recovering his senses. One of the other two men who had been ridden down now recovered enough to begin crawling away furiously. Do you want that chap? asked Abercrombie. I have no facilities for keeping him prisoner, Jack answered. For that matter, I guess he's nothing but a hired thug. The Washington police can find and take care of him at their convenience. Good enough, nodded the British lieutenant. And now... Would you mind if I go to her instead, inquired Benson hastily? No, no, not in least, dear old fellow, and while you're gone, I'll constitute myself as a special bobby to look after this chap of yours in the bracelets. So Jack hurried off up the road, wondering how Daisy Houston fared with a revolver and a hostile cabman. End of chapter 22 Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan Chapter Twenty Three of the Submarine Boys for the Flag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Chapter Twenty Three. Foreign Trade Becomes Brisk. The cab horses were browsing quietly by the roadside. Miss Daisy looked anything but perturbed. In fact, she had passed all uneasiness of spirit on to the cab driver. That worthy had come back to his senses, but Miss Houston had compelled him to sit on the ground, his back to a tree. She stood a few yards away watching the surly fellow and holding a pistol as though it were not the first time she had held such a weapon in her hand. Oh, I'm so glad you come, Mr. Benson, cried the girl with true feminine relief. I was so worried about you, but you're not hurt badly. I hurried a horseman on to you. He reached you. Yes, thank you, nodded Lieutenant Benson. And now, Miss Houston, I must inform you that we have Millard, your Donald Graves, a prisoner and mangled. I must first find a way of getting you back into town. Then I must turn Millard over to the authorities. Why can't he go back in the same cab with me? asked Miss Houston quickly. You you could endure that? Yes, replied the girl bravely. I took you to him. I sent the assistance that enabled you to take him prisoner. Do not fear for me, Mr. Benson. By Jove, but you're a clear grit, Miss Houston, Lieutenant Jack cried admirably. Clear American, I hope, retorted the girl. Why should men be the only ones who can do or dare for the flag? 
Will you let me have the revolver, Miss Houston? Gladly. Thank you. Now, if you'll get inside the cab again, and you, I'll sit with the driver and watch him. Jack kept his eye on the surly fellow until Miss Houston was inside the cab. Now, fellow, you get up on the box and handle the reins from the left side, ordered the young naval lieutenant. I always drive on the right side of the box, came the sulky retort. Undoubtedly, but you're driving on the left side this afternoon, returned Benson, with a look of significance. By the way, did I mention in fact that I have an uncertain and bad temper? Now climb up into your place, and don't you attempt to start until I'm beside you and gave the word. A moment later, Jack Benson sat beside the driver, holding the revolver in his right hand. Now back to the house, spoke the young naval officer. Without a word, the driver turned his horses about and headed back. Here we are, came cheerily from Lieutenant Abercrombie, R.N. Millard was sitting up, a black scowl on his face as Jack and the others appeared. Now I've got to get this outfit back into Washington somehow, mused Jack. After noticing that Abercrombie had allowed the other thugs to crawl away to safety, I have course, dear old fellow. You understand that I'm helping, hinted the British officer. Well, that's mighty good of you, murmured Jack. Then we can do it all easily. Daisy Houston had stepped from the cab. She stood regarding the scowling captive. I'm glad I know you, Donald. I'm glad I found out you in time, she said quietly, gazing hard at him. I thought you were a friend, Millard retorted bitterly. Great heavens, Daisy. If you had been on my side through thick and thin, in good report and ill, I could have defiled all these idiots in Washington. What an ally you would have been, but you chose to be an enemy. An enemy to my country's enemies, yes, replied the girl steadily. You hate me, Daisy. I don't know, answered the girl thoughtfully. You hate me now, Donald Graves? I wish I knew, uttered the man, but it's hard to turn love like mine into hate at a moment's notice. Daisy, the nights are coming when you'll wake up in a fright and sob as you remember how you turned me over to the officers of the country that you have done your best to betray, broke in the girl firmly. No, no, Donald, do not imagine I shall shed any tears for you, seen or unseen. Mr. Benson, I'm ready if you wish to place your, your prisoner in the cab beside me. Seems like a beastly outrage to do it, muttered Jack, full of misgivings. Not at all, declared the girl steadily. I'm glad to see that this man is on his way to the bar of justice. Jack assisted Davy Houston with the utmost deference to a seat inside the vehicle. Then he turned to motion to handcuff Millard or Graves that he was to take the seat beside the woman who he hoped to make his wife. I'll ride close alongside to make sure there's no unpleasant conduct toward Miss Houston, volunteered Mr. Abercrombie. Jack Benson again climbed to the cab. You know, I have this pistol, muttered Jack, showing the driver the weapon. There's no need to ride through the town with the weapon in my hand. But if you try to cut up any tantrums, you may be sure you'll find your own wrists inside of handcuffs. I know when I ain't got no show at all, growled the sullen driver. Drive ahead, then, into Washington, straight to the police headquarters. Lieutenant Abercrombie, R.N., jogged his own mount steadily alongside, so that he could see at all times a commanding view of the interior. Millard, Donald Grace, would have opened some conversation with Daisy Houston, but the disdainful girl cut him short. As the cab rolled into the busier streets of Washington, Lieutenant Abercrombie drew a little further away from the cab in order not to attract attention though he still remained actively on guard. The prisoner's manacle hands did not show to the people passing on the sidewalks, so altogether no passenger thought to turn to look at the cab. Just as the little procession turned a street corner to drive directly to the door of police headquarters, Abercrombie waved a hand carelessly to three pedestrians on the sidewalk. Abercrombie cried Lieutenant Elwyn, and there's Benson on the box of that hack. Come right along into headquarters, whispered Abercrombie. Don't make any noise. Wondering until they were fairly surprised, Elwyn, Hale, and Epp 
drew up at the cab door as Jack, after only a brief nod to them, opened the door and handed out Miss Daisy Houston. Lieutenant Abercrombie, having given his horse to a boy down the street to hold, now came forward, raising his hat, to take charge of the young lady. "'Come along, Millard,' cried Jack Benson quietly, and the prisoner got out, while the British officer stepped down the street with his fair companion to find another carriage in which she could return home. Inside, Jack marched his prisoner up to the railing in one of the rooms. The young naval officer at once produced his credentials and displayed them to the police officer in charge. Now, with your permission, sir, Jack went on, I courteously, I will use your telephone and inform the Navy Department of the prisoner who waits their action here. Five minutes later, this had been done. Benson turned to Lieutenant Abercrombie, saying, I must apologize for not having thought to return your revolver as soon as we entered. I would beg you to keep the weapon, dear old fellow, if it would be of any use to you, replied the British officer. And now Hal and Epp found chance to explain that they, worried by Jack's disappearance, had at least started down to headquarters to see if they could learn of any mishap to him or any other explanation for his long absence. Well, it's all over now, muttered Hal. Millard, or Graves, or whatever his name is, the fellow must be using at this moment, is safe in the cell downstairs. Well, we thought once before that we had him bottled up safely, chuckled Jack. Mr. Abercrombie, now I'm going to express my thanks to you. I should feel extremely insulted, dear old fellow, if you thought it necessary to thank me, retorted the Briton heartily. Will be dark soon, interposed Lieutenant Elwyn. I suggest that the best thing any of us can do is to turn toward the club. I feel certain that the chef will have a famous dinner there tonight. We haven't any evening clothes, either citizen or uniform, in Washington, interposed Jack Benson, who knew something of the formalities of the service during the dinner hour. Oh, come just the same, begged Elwyn. Members don't expect too much of fellows who are traveling. Jack was glad of the walk because it helped them to take the stiffness out of the knee that had been struck. You let the cab driver go, did you? asked Gep as the submarine boys walked along together. Yes, nodded Jack. I had no orders concerning anyone like him. He's only some worthless character hired for the job. He didn't have any hand in the bigger job of collecting and selling harbor defense plans, you may be sure. As the party re-entered the club, they found a large audience. Nor was it many moments before a bi-mustached German officer approached the group. Oh, Herr Elwin, he asked, can you oblige me by excusing Herr Benson for a moment or two? And will you come with me, Herr Benson, to meet a friend who wishes to shake your hand? Jack slipped away with the German officer who conducted him to another room. I think you have met my friend before, explained the German, and wheeled the submarine boy straight up in front of Herr Professor Radberg. You see, smiled the professor, we meet again. It's a great pleasure, surely, declared Jack as he shook hands. The officer stepped a few paces away. And now, when, my dear young friend, are you going to give me your word that you and your comrades will enter the German torpedo service? I have somewhat better terms to you than I did when we met last. I have since been authorized to promise you that you shall enter the German service as commissioned officers, and that you shall all three be in line for promotion as merit earns it. So then, it is all settled, is it not? Herr Professor Radberg rubs his hands with self-satisfying air. Yes, Lieutenant Jack admitted it is all subtle, but not the way you wish, Herr Professor Radberg. There may be soldiers of fortune who follow any flag for hire, but we're some marine boys who would not enter your German naval service if you created all three of us as high as admirals at the outset. Admirals? cried here professor radberg protesting oh but that my dear young friend would be quite impossible you are wasting your time with us sir jack continued firmly we may one of these days be asked to enter american service permanently we would not enter any other country's service no matter what the bait 
do not give the matter any further thought, please, for we won't. The German officer had been standing a few paces away, twirling his mustache and frowning. Now he came forward. Herr Benson, he broke in. I fear that you are so young that you do not fully understand the honor and dignity of being officers in the German service. Very likely we do not, Captain, Jack returned with a bow, and is absolutely certain that we shall never find out from experience. Lieutenant Jack excused himself, turning to seek his friends. As Benson entered the reading room once more, he came upon Epp, another whose face was decidedly familiar. It was Chevalier Diore. Just in time, Jack nodded up. Tell the chef for me, please, as he doesn't seem to understand my talk, that we wouldn't even give the slightest consideration to his idea that we should enter the French naval service in the submarine division. It's quite hopeless, Chevalier, laughed Jack Benson, shaking his head. The honor is quite enough to turn our heads, but we can only serve the United States. The Chevalier made a low bow, then turned away for others who were approaching. Where's Hal? asked Jack. Crickety, look at him over there, talking to that little Japanese, muttered Epp, inclining his head toward a corner. Alan and the Japanese man were talking earnestly. At any rate, the little brown man was. Hal was listening, occasionally shaking his head. Then Hastings happened to espy his chums. He turned to the Japanese to take his leave. But the little brown man followed him across the floor, still talking in low tones. Captain Nakasura had been trying to interest me in the idea that we three go over to Japan under a three-year contract to act as instructors and advisors in submarine work, Hal told his comrades. And I have high hopes that we'll see the same as I did, smiled the Japanese at the shape persistently. We shan't, Jack declared, shaking his head emphatically. Captain, you are the third representative, also the third nation, that has just approached us on this matter. We shall serve no other country than our own. But my government, urged the Japanese officer, will make you the most handsome offer. Do you remember the day when we were leaving Dunhaven and you tried to overtake us in a gasoline launch? asked Jack with a smile. Yes, very well, admitted Nakasura. Do you remember that we hoisted the signal N.D.? That meant nothing doing, Captain. Our answer is the same, and will be tomorrow and the next year. Ah, here you are, cried Lieutenant Amber Crombie, as he hurried up and Captain Nakasura vanished beyond middle distance. Benson, dear old fellow, I just want a word with you before dinner is served, continued the Briton, thrusting his arms through Jack's and drawing him away after a nod of apology to Hal and Epp. Benson? I've had something on my mind all day, something I've had instructions to broach to you. I've been waiting for the right moment. Now I must breathe just a word or two, and then let you think it over during dinner. Don't you know? See here, smiled Jack, standing back, sudden suspicion in his eyes. Don't tell me you've been instructed to see whether I'll enter the British submarine service. Just that, dear old chap, beamed Bambercrombie enthusiastically. But how could you guess? Fact, though. And not only you, but Hastings and Summers as well, don't you know? You're the fourth to spring this on us tonight, answered Jack Benson, soberly. And the answer will have to be the same for all of you. The same for all of us, dear chap? demanded Abercrombie. How can that be? The answer in every case is the same, retorted Jack. If our own government doesn't want us, no other government can have us. We stand by our own flag. Ah, what is this? muttered Lieutenant Elwyn, coming unexpectedly upon the pair. Foreign governments competing for you, lads, Benson? Oh, this won't do. Which is what I've just had the honor of telling Mr. Abercrombie, smiled Jack earnestly. End of chapter 23 Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan Chapter 24 of the Submarine Boys for the Flag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan. The Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham. Chapter 24 Their Lives Deeded to the Flag. Secretary Saunders, Secretary of the Navy, looked up at the three young men who stood in line at the right-hand side of his desk. It was two days later, two days after during which Jack, Hal, and Epp had had little to do except roam about Washington and see all the sights of the nation's capital. This they had varied by dropping in at the United Service Club. Gentlemen, remarked the Secretary of the Navy, you have not yet been relieved of your detail to the gunboat Sudbury. It's coming now, though each of the three boys to himself with a great wave of dismay. We're no longer to be in the Navy. I will give instructions at once, continued Secretary Saunders, to have orders issued relieving you from that duty. Yes, it has come, muttered Jack drearily to himself. Our service with the Navy is over. Gentlemen, and now for a few seconds the voice of the Secretary seemed far away indeed. I am all sensible of all you have done for your country, and above all, of the zeal you have shown. Besides, I have in mind that fact that you have made yourselves among the most expert of all handlers of submarine torpedo boats. If it can be arranged, I wish to keep all three of you actively in the United States Navy. Jack Benson looked up with a gasp. His comrades were not less astounded. I am aware, Mr. Saunders went on, that we could not expect you to enlist as mere apprentices. In your own particular field of submarine work, you are amply fitted to hold officers' commissions. Yet, under the law, you cannot be granted commissions until you are twenty-one years of age. None of you are quite eighteen. Therefore, it has occurred to me that we can be appointed, specially with rank, command, and pay, until you are twenty-one. The president agrees with me in what I have to offer. You, Mr. Benson, are offered a special appointment as lieutenant, junior grade, in the United States Navy. You, Mr. Hastings, and you, Mr. Summers, are offered special appointments as ensigns. You will have all the privilege of your ranks except the actual commission. You will be actual officers and entitled to full respect. Moreover, the president promises that when you are twenty-one years of age, you shall have regular commissions promptly. In case the president is not re-elected to his office, he agrees to urge upon his successor in the White House the fulfillment of the promise. So if you accept the special appointments now, you are absolutely certain of commissions as soon as you reach the age of twenty-one. Perhaps it is only just to add that we are all aware that all three of you have already been offered commissions in foreign navies and that you have all refused. Both the President and myself appreciate your loyalty to your own flag. Now, what do you young gentlemen say to accepting special appointments to run until you are each twenty-one? Mr. Secretary is the brightest one of the greatest dreams of all of us, Jack Benson replied hoarsely. There's just one thing that could hold us back. We really feel an honor bound to Mr. Farnham and Mr. Pollard to stand by their interests. Uh, they have been our best friends. What do you say to that, Mr. Farnham? inquired the secretary. From behind a screen stepped Jacob Farnham, the Dunhaven shipbuilder. Why, see here, boys, began Farnham, a broad smile on his face. I received a long wire from Mr. Saunders yesterday. David Pollard and I talked things over, and we decided that the Pollard boat is now an assured success. He'll put the boats where we can now build and run them without you. You're more needed than the Navy, boys. Now Dave and I both urge you to go where you know your hearts are, into the Navy. And you will go with our best wishes. The government needs you now to handle the boats that we build up at Dunhaven and to train war crews for those boats. There's only one objection to your entering the Navy, boys. You will have to pass upon our boats. We know you will do that honestly and fearlessly, yet there are many who would sneer and having boats passed on for the government by young officers who hold stock in our concern. Now the amount of stock that each of you holds has been growing steadily with each new success that you have won for us, which if you entered the Navy you should not own. So Dave and I offer you $10,000 each for the shares that you hold. It's a fair valuation. 
I know it is if you offered it, Mr. Farnham, Jack Benson replied with a feeling. Then you'll accept and take your very heart's wish, the Navy, all of you, asked Mr. Farnham. I accept both your offer, Mr. Farnham, and the greater offer of the Secretary of the Navy, replied Jack, his eyes becoming misty. I accept, murmured Hal. So do I, from Epp. Then, sir, declared Jacob Farnham, turning to the Secretary of the Navy, the flag is richer by these three magnificent young fellows. Here we must leave the submarine boys for the present. For these events happened hardly later than yesterday, and there are no new adventures yet to chronicle. Donald Graves, or Millard, received a severe sentence in the penitentiary. He is still serving the sentence, of course. Gray, his accomplice, who attempted to spirit the drawings outside the United States, is now likewise serving the term. The trial was a swift, nearly secret one. Daisy Houston was not dragged into the case at all. In one respect, the trial failed. Neither culprit could be forced to tell which foreign government the dastardly work had been attempted. The Spitfire returned to Dunhaven and was later sold to the governor with several other boats. Williamson became the new Pollard captain. Several foreign governments were deeply disappointed over not being able to secure the services of the submarine boy. But Jack, Hal, and Epp could be happy nowhere except under their own flag. They are now accepted most cordially by all their brother officers, young and old, in the United States Navy. For the most part, so far, the duties of our young officers have been aboard the different boats purchased from the Pollard Company. Yet for the sake of practice and change, they have been, at times, detailed aboard other classes of craft in the Navy. We shall now encounter our young acting naval officers in one of their new fields of special work in the next volume of the series, which is published under the title The Submarine Boys and the Smugglers, or Breaking Up the New Jersey Customs Fraud. Here we shall find out our talented lads engaged in doing some of their finest work for Uncle Sam's government, and under circumstances that will delight every reader. End of chapter 24 Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan End of the Submarine Boys for the Flag by Victor G. Durham